Hey, good morning. Good wow. morning. That's a crowd. And I think we have the two oldest people on the stage yet. <clears throat> so it's, it's good to be back in Prague. We were actually here, I think, six years ago. And it's wonderful to be back. Uh, I wished our trip had been slightly less eventful. We got our bags this morning, yeah. which wasn't exactly when we arrived. But hey, we got the bags, so that's, that's definitely a pro. Uh, so I'm Dirk Hondel. I'm the uh, Chief Open Source Officer for VMware, and you are again? I am Linus, and uh, I hate doing public speaking. So <laughs> for the last probably 15 years by now, uh, this has been the only format I basically do, because this way I don't have to prepare slides, and I don't have to think about what the audience wants to hear about. That's his job. <laughs> and he asks the questions, and we try to make this interesting. And I don't know the questions beforehand, so we'll see what it'll be. So it's not been 15 years. It only feels that long, Linus. Um, we started doing this six years ago, actually. So 4.14 RC6 is out, and you said in the announcement that you might have to do an RC8. So right. I always ask myself, is this good or is this bad? Or where does it come from? Um, I have to say, we have no real rules about how many RCs we do. It's just that over... We, so in the kernel community, we use the same process now for over a decade, where for two weeks we have the merge window. I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this. And then we have a number of weeks of weekly RCs. And, uh, and I'm mostly really guided by how it feels. Having done this for a long time, uh, it's not like I have a checklist of this needs to be done before I make a release. It's really a looking at what the patterns of patches coming in. Is it, does it feel like it's slowing down? And, uh, and we usually end up with seven RCs and then, then the final release. So it takes us about two and a half months. Uh, with the merge window. And this particular merge window was more painful than usual, probably because Greg, who's in the room <laughs> somewhere, uh, announced that it's going to be a long-term support thing. And that always means that all the companies who care about the long-term support kernels, they say, hey, we need to get our features in this release. So there's more hurrying going on, going on than there normally is. One of the nice things about our normal release schedule is we do releases every two and a half months. So people don't feel pressured to hit a particular release. If, if the code is not ready, it's not ready, it's fine, I'll wait until the next merge window, except when long-term releases happen. So we've, the last one was 4.9, and it was the largest kernel ever. Uh, and uh, current one is going to be 4.14, and uh, it's slightly more painful than some of the earlier kernels were. But so right now, it feels like I'll probably extend it by one release cur uh, candidate, but we'll see what happens. So you're talking about painful, and obviously here in Prague is the Linux Kernel Maintainer Summit. So which subsystems cause you the most trouble, or to, if you want to be positive, which are the role models? Or both? Um, I am going to name names, but I'm going to name names in private tomorrow <laughs> during the, <laughs> the kernel summit. Uh, I guess I can speak about one of the shining stars, which is ARM, which I used to hate. And now it's like one of the shining stars of good behavior, and I never have any issues with them anymore. Uh, the, the, the problems problem spots tend to move around a bit, although there are a few recurring ones that I will, we will be discussing tomorrow. Oh, so words will be spoken. That's interesting. So one thing that I found interesting when, when Jim introduced our, our first speakers was his focus uh, in, in, in talking about the, the kernel report on how many first-time developers we <laughs> have and, and how this community keeps getting younger. Yet, looking at the two of us, I've known you for more than 25 years, and looking at the, uh, at the kernel community in general, and specifically at the maintainer community, I think we are seeing not a lot of influx of new maintainers. And part of that, I think, is the 
insane complexity of, of what we do. So what do you think about, do we do enough to get young, younger blood into the maintainer community? I don't know. I mean, that is probably one of our biggest issues is that it's, uh, being a maintainer is kind of painful. It's not that it necessarily is hard once you get used to it, but you do need to have a lot of experience. You need to have experience for two reasons. One is just, uh, in order to handle all the flow, uh, you just need to have done it for long enough that it's not overwhelming. Uh, it's like learning a new language. It's hard in the beginning, and, and you, if you get a thousand emails, and you have to walk through each one and decode it and think a lot about it. It's a lot of work compared to somebody who's been doing it for 15 years or 25 years. Uh, and, and by now, I see patches in my sleep. I see a patch and I know what it does. And I don't, I don't spend any time thinking about it because it's all automatic. So that's one reason maintainerships tend to be with people who has been around for a long time. The other reason is purely external. Uh, you need to not only have grown the capacity to, to handle the inflow of patches, you need to also have shown to the community that you're reliable and you're around, and you're around every day of the year, or you are part of a group that, that is responsible and somebody's around pretty much every day of the year. Uh, so getting new maintainers has been one of our biggest problems. We, uh, we have people who, uh, for one reason or another, decide that maintainership is, they've been doing it as their main job for a decade, and they decide that they are moving on to doing something else. Having a they, life having a life, <laughs> or maybe they're moving on to a different area because they moved companies or something like that. And, and then uh, finding new people to, to pick up the slack can be a big problem. And it's not something that a new person can just come in and do. Uh, but the good news is, if you do want to be a maintainer, trust me, we want maintainers. I love maintainers. I've, I, it may not always appear that way in my emails, <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but, but people it's who... It's a rough kind it, of love. It is a, it is a tough love. But, but people who, who do the work and are reliable are absolutely, I mean, the most important people in the community. And, and we are looking for people. And, and if you can show that you are reliable and you are there and you are responsive, you don't have to be perfect, don't get, get me wrong. Uh, everybody makes mistakes, everybody sends in bad stuff, but if... If you then stand up and said, sorry, my bad, and here's the fix, that makes people trust you. And you do need to do it for a few years to show that you really are, you not only are trustworthy, but you have the capacity to stick to something. Uh, but if you want to be a maintainer, it's not that hard in the end because we want you. So over the last few years, you have pushed many of the major subsystems to have maintainer groups, so two, three, four people. Yeah. Is that a way to mentor new maintainers, to add them to an established group and have them grow in that rotation? It probably could be. We have done it mainly for a different reason. Mm -hmm. We have done it because uh, being there every day or every week is tough. <laughs> and, uh, and one single person will eventually burn out. And people take vacations. And I'm... I'm in a good position where I can usually time my vacations, not always, but I try very hard to time my vacations so that they're in the end of the RC series when my workload is much lower because at that point I, know I don't have to do 20 pull requests a day. I have two or three or Tuesdays I usually have none. For some reason it's Fridays and Saturdays that I get most pull requests. Uh, but, but if you're a subsystem maintainer and you get these occasional patches from driver developers or somebody else, you need to be there day in and day out. And having, instead of having one person maintain a subsystem, having three or four people maintain one has turned out to be a, a good way to uh, allow people to, 
to not have to be there all the time. But it probably would be a good way to bring new people in too. So maybe a, a, a maintain a mentoring program is something you should discuss at the maintainer summit. Probably. I, I mean, you don't come in as a maintainer no, from nowhere. You, you come in as a maintainer because you used to be a developer. And uh, mostly the maintainership hierarchy, it, it sometimes looks like we actually designed this thing, and that is not the case. We don't have a committee that says, now you are the maintainer. It is very organic. It happens fairly automatically. Um, if you have been a developer and active for a while. It might be more of a tag your it <laughs> than a committee saying, hey, we have a new maintainer. It's more like, you've been doing the work. Now I'll take all my patches from you. So I'll try a fun question. Uh, who in the audience was born 1991 or later? So all these people, Linux has been around for all of their lives. You have to, you have to imagine that. When, when we started with Linux in, in 91, to us, Unix felt like this old OS that had been around forever, and all these old gray beards were at the Usenix conferences. At that point, Unix was about 20 years old. It was started in 71. We were starting in 91. So we have now more history that Unix had back then. Does that frighten you? No, I actually, when you put it that way, it sounds odd, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's not how I really think. I have, I have the memory of a goldfish. I remember about five minutes back in time, the 25 years ago is kind of hazy. By the way, hi, I'm Dirk. Yeah, hi. Good. Yeah. He knows I'm particularly bad with faces and names, so... If you feel like I should know you and I did not say hi to you outside, it's because I have no idea who you are. <laughs> <laughs> On that happy note, yeah. um, let's, let's switch to one of your favorite topics, security. Oh, yeah. So um, those of us who live in the US or who have any business dealings in the US, of course, are super excited about Equifax, my, my favorite company right now. Um, if you, if you see the impact that lapses in security have on all of our lives, has that in any way changed your, I don't want to say attitude, but maybe that is the right term, your approach to security and thinking about security people? And, and you know, this is a PG audience, so please. Um, security people don't tend to be my favorite kind of people. <laughs> and that's, don't get me wrong, that's not because I don't like security. It's because a lot of the security community is about this whole, look at me, I found a bug, I'm, I want to spread the word about how great I am, because that's how they bring in business. If you're in a security company, being this kind of uh, self-serving uh, person is often a way to be, do marketing. And, and I realized that the good security people in the audience now should f probably feel like, that's not me. But sadly, the good security people are the ones that you don't see because they don't do this thing, right? So security people often annoy me. Uh, that said, uh, I mean, there's no question it's important. And I'm actually very happy we, we've had a lot of uh, what I find very healthy, the, the random testing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge believer in fussing. And, and part of that is uh, because I'm a huge believer in testing but, and not so much reading code. I think it's way too easy to uh, miss very obvious things when you read code because the code looks obvious and there's an ob obvious bug there that you missed because it looks so obvious. Uh, so testing is the only way to find most things. But most security bugs end up, end up being in, in these code paths that no sane person ever tests. And, and fussing tends to be a great way to try to uh, automate that insane behavior. And I, I think the kernel community has, or particularly a few big companies, you guys know who you are, have been very active in creating fussing tools for areas that we didn't necessarily 
uh, do that well on before. Uh, all the device uh, driver testing by fussing bogus devices has been really good. Uh, it's found a number of bugs. Uh, most of them, those bugs are pretty hard to exploit. It's often things where you have to have a specially crafted USB stick that lies to the operating system. And if you happen to use that USB stick and, and put it in your laptop, it takes over your laptop if the, if the kernel does something wrong. But it, this is the kind of testing that, that I think is actually very effective. So uh, we're doing better. I mean, we're, I'm not claiming we're perfect in any, in any way, but, but I do think we're doing better. I, I think we have made tremendous progress the last five, six years. And I also think that our attitude has changed. Ours as the whole kernel community. There is a lot more attention to this and a lot more, a lot more willingness to listen to people who come with new ideas and, and who bring up concerns. We, we also, I'd like to call out not just the fussing, there's a, a lot of tooling that I have to admit, five, six years ago, I was not that, that optimistic about. Uh, we've had tooling that helped us find things like locking bugs. LockDep has been incredibly powerful for us to do uh, good locking and find when we do locking wrong. But now we're having a lot of these uh, compiler uh, tools that automates other classes of, of bug finding. And Ksan and, and other things have been very powerful in, in finding bugs that uh, no human would ever find. Mm -hmm. So let's switch gear a little bit and, and not talk about Linux for a moment. Um, looking at community projects, and I truly mean community projects, so not things like Android, um, why are some areas in which open source communities pop up very, very successful, the kernel being, of course, the poster child, and others aren't? What, what makes it so unique that some open source projects take over the world, but the vast majority of them never really take off? Um, I still actually think, so I used to say that nobody would ever do an open source database because databases are horribly boring. And I still think databases are horribly boring, but I was clearly wrong because people do do open source databases. Uh, but I, I do think that the open source projects that tend to be most successful uh, are the ones that are good at finding commonalities. A lot of it is about infrastructure, which turns out databases actually fit in that thing. But a lot of it ends up, I think, being about things where there's fairly easy to find agreement. So a kernel is something everybody needs, and there are not that many arguments about what the needs are. Uh, when you go over to some more user-visible things, UIs and things like that, suddenly people disagree a lot more <laughs> uh, about what's the right thing to do. Uh, so I think one of the reasons that, that technical, particularly technical projects, tend to flourish very, very well in open source is that, that when you have a very technical area, you also you can show real numbers. You can say, this is the way, the right way, and, and it's much easier to find a community in, in agreement around that than there necessarily is in some other areas. Uh, but you also need to have a big enough community. I mean, we've seen that in Divelog software. <laughs> it turns out Divelog software is not a huge community, so it's hard to grow a big open source project around Divelogging. While everybody needs a kernel, everybody needs uh, source control, uh, not everybody needs to log their scuba diving. Sounds Who weird knew? to me. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about this. What does make a project successful? Or actually, how would you measure whether a project is successful? I actually don't like thinking in those terms, because that's not why I do any of my work. I mean, who cares if something is successful or not? That's not the big issue. Right? The big issue is whether it's interesting and uh, whether it does what you want it to do. And 
in the end, it is successful if it does something you want it to do, whether it has five users or 50 million users. Who cares in the end, right? But that then gets us straight to the question, what makes a good developer, or what is it that, that drives a good developer? I really don't think there's one answer. Uh, the open source community, when I started, was much more homogeneous than it is today. Uh, there were the geeky white male with often a beard, right? <laughs> and, and we all did things that no sane person should be interested in. And I think that has changed. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more, I mean, it's not like it's diverse, but, uh, but you have people who come into the community because they're interested in actual graphical design or documentation or all these things that did not exist when I started, I think. At least I never saw them. And, and I don't think there is any particular one thing. I mean, I can, I can guess at what makes uh, somebody a good programmer. If you started programming when you were 10 or 11, you're probably a good programmer, right? That's, that's what it takes. It takes a decade or more of doing something. Uh, and that's true of pretty much everything. I don't think that's real, real limited to programming. But I, I actually think from that you can derive a little bit of what I consider key criteria. There needs to be something that you care about and that you're willing to invest in long time and 25 years of doing the kernel. And also it has to be fun for you. If yeah. you as a developer find developing software miserable, I don't think you will ever turn into a good developer. I agree. I mean, uh, definitely. I, at the same time, I really don't think that has anything to do with programming or doing projects. I mean, if you want to be an athlete, the same thing has to be true, right? I'm not one. Uh, and I never will be because I don't find it fun or interesting. I accept my extra baggage. Uh, but, but it's true probably in marketing, too. You probably need to actually enjoy talking to people. <laughs> right? Right? So. Okay, so um, speaking of developers, uh, there is a topic that I know you love to talk about, and, and so I'll ask my next question very specifically. Explain your recent love for C++, because I got C++ patches from you just recently. Oh, no. <laughs> this is a, I suspect if I start swearing on uh, no, don't, Jim, don't, no, mm -mm. Jim goes like this. No, no. Now, no, PG. I, it's all PG, remember? It's all PG. No, no, it's a lovely language. <laughs> let's, let's leave it at that. I, I did wonder how anybody could ever develop anything in, in that when it takes so long to just build stuff. I mean, a small file takes a couple of seconds to build. I would never be able to live that way. Yeah, we were, we were sitting in the hotel room and he made a change to a C++ file and rebuilt subsurface and said, my kernel compiles faster than this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and a very related question. Um, do you like providing end user support? Because that you also do, which I find fascinating, given your otherwise public persona. Uh, no, I actually don't do end-user support. If you're talking about my family, they'd like to disagree with you. <laughs> no, uh, I'm talking about you responding to a lot of requests we get on the subsurface mailing list oh, for no. random users who have very simple problems. And Linus is our top supporter at this point. I, no, it's, it turns out, even though I'm not a, actually a people person, I'll be the first to say that I don't recognize people and I don't li like talking to you guys. Over email, it's different. One of the reasons I got into Linux, or why I continued getting into Linux, let's put it that way, is I actually like uh, interacting with people over technical matters, and I do not mind bug triage and things like that at all. And it turns out, in the kernel, I no longer ever do that. There is, I mean, by the time something hits my inbox on kernel issues, it's already gone through bug triage, through three levels of people, and it's probably something really nasty, and there's no way I want to interact with this IT person at a company who sees odd behavior. No. But, but sometimes it's nice to have a small project, not 
like subsurface, but also Git was a, when I started Git, it's over 10 years ago now, mm -hmm. but it was actually relaxing and interesting to do something small with small problems, right? Uh, so I still enjoy that part. Uh, in the, on the kernel side, I don't do any programming. I, I end up spending all my time just reading email and pulling patches from people. And, uh, and honestly, it, it wouldn't really make much sense for me to do anything else. But, but it, it is kind of nice to also have a different project where you actually do look at code and where I'm no longer one of the main maintainers, but I, I still am one of the people who knows how pretty much everything works. So. But that brings me to my next question. So why do you do what you do and, and ignore the fact that Jim pays you? Uh, but what is it that makes you go back every morning and go through hundreds of emails and dozens of pull requests and, and keep doing this for 25 years? It is a very long time. Um, I still like the technology. Um, I still actually like the people, again, despite sometimes my negative emails being the ones that are showcased. Uh, I really enjoy interacting with people. Uh, I like doing something that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, the kernel matters to a lot of people. Being in charge of a project that is something that people care about is something that gives your life meaning, right? Um, it's, not, it's not necessarily the thing that uh, gets me up in the morning, but I would be really, really bored if I didn't do kernel development. So I end up going away for a week at a time, usually doing scuba diving, but I do end up, even when I'm on vacation, um, I read email at least three times a day just because if I don't do that, um, I just fall behind too much. And then occasionally, very occasionally, I tell Greg and a couple of other people that, hey, guys, I'm actually going to be completely incommunicado for a week or two. And, uh, and that's an odd time for me. I mean, that's usually when I'm somewhere where there is no internet at all. And after a week, I'm so ready to get back because that's my life doing, doing Linux in the end. The hamster wheel keeps spinning. Um, so I, I know how much you like to do predictions, so I have to have a prediction question. And I, I tried to come up with one that I haven't asked you before, and given that we have done this a few times, it's becoming harder. So what is the most surprising thing that will happen in Linux in the next year? Well, uh, that is not how I really work. I mean, uh, to me, every day is a new day, and maybe it's the incipient Alzheimer's, but more of it is that I don't really plan ahead. Uh, I kind of know what's coming in a very big view, where just because I do end up talking to both hardware companies and obviously to a developer, de developers who plan what, uh, and talk about what they're working on. But at the same time, uh, most of my life ends up being reacting, not so much uh, predicting what's coming up. Uh, so I'm very comfortable in having the, the flow that we have and not trying to to make the next big thing happen, but to make sure that we're doing the best we can every day. And, and I don't know what, we, what we will be doing in one year, but I don't think we're changing that much fundamentally anymore. I have been surprised before, though. So, so then I'll ask you about something that you actually fully control and most likely can mathematically project. So when are we going to get Linux 5.0? Oh, well, I have... I have been known to start losing track of numbers when they when go into the fingers, 20s and 30s. Fingers and, and toes? And yeah, no, I, yeah, when I had to take off my shoes to, to count kernel releases. Uh, no, it's, it's psychological for me. Uh, 
it turns out 13 and 14, they're easy to remember. But when you're looking back and you can't recall the difference between 23 and 24, or the, the numbers, smaller numbers stand out more. So I suspect that we'll hit 4.19, and, and instead of 4.20, I might decide it's time to 5.0. 5, 5 the numbers don't mean anything at all. They have not meant anything in a long time. Uh, it was actually very stressful when, back when they did. Uh, it was a horrible model for development. I remember, I mean, even back in the 1.0 days, just trying to, like, draw the line in the water, in the sand of, of this is 1.0, and this is when the, our internet code is actually working, it was really tough and very stressful. And then you uh, never end up doing the right decision anyway. So jettisoning that entirely and saying, no, the numbers don't mean anything. They do keep incrementing, but we just try to make them sound like easier to remember than, than any other kind of meaningfulness has made my life much easier. And I, I think pretty much everybody enjoys it now. But then there are still the few people, when I make 5.0 and they expect lots of new features, they're <laughs> disappointed. Yes. Sorry so, if I get my math right, that means next summer-ish? Probably. Um, I also did some numerology and decided that every two million Git objects <laughs> is when, when I need to do a new major release. But since our development is accelerating, that actually might be sooner than next summer. Wow. So, it really depends on... I, I, it's a random number, and I want people to be aware that it's a random number and has no meaning. Well, then you could jump to 6.0 and just confuse everyone. Oh, that would, that is actually a great idea. <laughs> and on that, yes. our yes. time is up. Thank yes. you very much for your attention. Thank you. Nicely done. Well done.